The actual proposal is, is not a proposal about how to make all decisions that a society has to make. It really is limited to sort of the standard economic decisions. Um, now, in some ways, um, you know, in, in some ways, it already covers what you're asking me about. Um, there's implicitly in this proposal um, a child allowance. Why should children's economic consumption rights be tied to, in this case, the efforts of the, the effort ratings of their parents? Um, so implicit in this proposal is that, well, one of the decisions society has to make is what's the basic consumption right of children at different ages um, in terms of when they're in school, et cetera, et cetera. So one thing that's very different is my, my, own, my own feeling on this is that it, it is not necessary and it's not wise to tie the consumption rights of children to their biological parents. There's no need to do that. Um, this, is, this, this does not answer a host of questions about child rearing and child care. Um, and I've been chastised on this subject. I'm, I'm good friends with many feminist economists. And they quickly point out what you've just pointed out. Well, you haven't even talked about 80% of what I really care about. And my answer for a long time was, and you wouldn't trust me to be the one that figured it out, and you shouldn't. You're the feminist economist, and I'll give you my proxy. Uh, I've been trying to get Barbara Ehrenreich and Nancy Fulbright to sort of design their sort of answer to how to you, how would be the best way in a better society to actually make the arrangements for pay for child care, not pay for child care. Um, so there really is not anything within this particular proposal that answers a host of those kinds of questions. Um, now, there are some people who, just as this, this is not a proposal for how to handle political decision making either. And there are people who have worked on that. Um, and Steve Shalom is somebody who has thought about alternative political decision making procedures and he calls it pair polity for, the, for short. Um, and there are some people like Cynthia Peters who, is all, who have also written about, well, if we want to have you know, the, gender ec the, the, the gender relations or the kinship system, um, do we really want to leave it the way it is now or is that something also that should be you know, organized in a very different way? And if it should be organized in a very different way, what would be a better way to do that? Um, so there are other people who have worked on what, what, what we all have in common is those goals or values about sort of what we're trying to achieve. And then the question is, but when you design a political system with those goals in mind, what does it look like? When you design, when you design kinship and child rearing system with those goals in mind, what does it look like? Um, and there are portions of the ZNet site that are devoted to sort of kinship vision and political vision. So my, my, the important part of my answer is, this is not a proposal that answers those questions, which is not to say that those questions are any less important than the ones that are being addressed by this proposal. I am on record for four decades as saying, you know, <coughs> A desirable economy is no more important than a desirable kinship system, a desirable political system, a desirable sort of cultural community system. These are all important parts of any society, and the economy is not the be-all and the end-all. Um, so it's not a comprehensive social proposal. That's the, easy, that's the short answer. It, this is not a comprehensive proposal about how to organize society. Um, there are huge missing parts. It's simply a comprehensive and concrete proposal about, about how to better organize what are considered to be just the fundamental economic issues that, that arise in any society.
Cynthia Peters is the person, um, Jason, I'm trying to, Cynthia Peters has written more specifically about that. Um, and, and she has three or four essays that are available on the ZNet website. Yeah. Um, I've, got, I've got sort of a question and then a comment. Um, Go. The first, the question was um, to ask about self-employment and whether there, what sort of capacity there is within this model for people being self-employed. Right. Because um, I'm, I mean, I'm trained to be an art historian at the moment, and I'd quite like to be self-employed ultimately. And the reason for it is not because I want to be an individual person trying to get as much money for myself as I can, but simply just because I want to have total control over my own working day and um, just be able to get up when I want and, you know, sometimes knock off early, sometimes work later, that kind of thing. And I'm happy to do it within a, in a cooperative way with others and in a socialised economy. Um, but part of this is there's quite a lot of emphasis on work, bigger workplaces and work it's true. You know, so I just wanted to know a bit more about the, the self-employment side and whether that's feasible within it. And then the comment was just um, to uh, sort of say a bit, um, how do I put it? I think one thing that could be maybe emphasised more within Paracon, and I think it's implicit within it, um, is the goal of abolishing uh, roads and sort of disempowering work as opposed to just creating giant balanced job complexes that balance it. Because I think one thing that probably one of the worst aspects of most people's lives is not just financial insecurity that comes as a result of being within a capitalist economy, but the, just that day-to-day -day experience of just the sheer boredom and monotony of, of, most, of most jobs, you know. Right. Um, so maybe sort of putting a bit more emphasis on how we can accelerate automation to get rid of a lot of that road work and have it done by computers and machines so that people are free from the need to I think that might be quite a good sort of selling point for the paracon. Okay. Let me, let me do the second. Let me comment on your comment, and then I'll answer your question. Okay? Um, maybe, maybe, maybe I'll lean over backwards not to be overly Pollyannish about what we tell people is possible. Um, and, I, and I think, so my own sense is that's been a weakness in the past, that we've sort of told people that, well, if you get rid of capitalism, then all that nasty part of work is going to go away. Because then we'll have automation that eliminates all the, you know, all the jobs that nobody wants to do, all the tasks that nobody wants to do. Um, robots will clean the toilets. That's why you want to get rid of capitalism. Um, so. So I've sort of been at pains to say there's no reason to believe that every task that on average people don't want to do is going to disappear. On the other hand, in, under capitalism, most, I mean, there's two kinds of technological innovation. One has to do with changing the products, and the other has to do with changing the way they're produced. And there's very little incentive for capitalists to engage in technological innovation that makes the work process less burdensome. Clearly, there is more incentive for workers' councils, and when workers' councils, they'll be, I mean, they'll have their own federations and they'll have their own research and development sort of units that are responsible to them. And clearly, there's a lot more incentive for them to prioritize when they talk with their engineers and the people that are looking at new ways of doing things, they're going to say, well, here are the tasks that we really don't like and or that are dangerous or unhealthy, and we want you to prioritize your search for new and better ways to make things that eliminate these as quickly as possible. I think clearly there is a greater incentive for those so I, I do believe there would be a rather significant change in the speed at which we are eliminating tasks that are the ones people don't want to do in this kind of an economy. And I think what you're saying, your comment is, well, why don't you say that out loud? And it's, I hesitate 
because I think it's been oversold. Oversold in the way, oh, well, eventually when the forces of production develop sufficiently, we'll have communism because anybody can ask for anything they want and anybody can do or not do whatever they want. That sort of talk, I think, actually is inaccurate um, and doesn't sell anymore because people know it's blowing smoke. Um, but I think your point is actually very well taken, that if you look at the incentives for... If you look at incentives under the present system, it's easy to see why those tasks don't get eliminated, especially if you can pay very cheaply for people to carry them out. On the other hand, when it's the people carrying them out that are the ones that are deciding what are we looking for new ways to do, I think you get a very different outcome. Um, you can just join an artist collect. I mean, you, you find another 10 artists, form, a work, form an artist workers council, and when all of you say to each other, we certainly aren't going to tell each other when to get up and when not to get up and when to paint and when not to paint, you're good to go. That's a little tricky on the how do we evaluate your output end because you're going to ask for paintbrushes and paints and we're going to say, okay, that's fine, but it does cost us something. And then if you say, I'm going to produce some music that nobody wants to listen to, and I'm going to produce a painting that nobody wants to see, then, then we, not, not you personally, but the sum, the, sum total, the sum total output that you are all promising us, the 10 of you are promising us that you will provide. Um, and and that I think, that's where the tricky part comes in. And my own, my, my own personal view is that there, there's no way around it. And in fact... Artists have always struggled with this and always will struggle with this. And that is, to what extent do I have to produce something the public likes? And to what extent am I free to say, you idiot public, you don't know art, and I do, and maybe 10 years from now, I mean, Beethoven was unpopular. Schoenberg was really unpopular. I still can't listen to Schoenberg. Mm -hmm. So I actually think in the case of art, that there's a special role that should be played by artist collectives in having a greater, just like if, if you're the, I mean, symphony shouldn't have conductors. They should all be chamber music, right? Mm -hmm. um, but what, what conductors now do is they have to choose their program, sort of knowing their audience, and they're constantly saying, I have some audience favorites, I sprinkle that in, and then I can get this brilliant new composer that nobody's ever heard of, but it's, you know, the audience doesn't know how to listen to it yet, and I'll, I'll have one of those in the program going along with Beethoven's Fifth. So I, I think that basically your federation of artist collectives somehow are going to have to negotiate that inevitable, you know, sort of, sort, sort of situation that has always been more difficult for, 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 for art than it is in other areas. But individually, it's easy. And, and, and if you couldn't get along with any other artist at all, um, I, there's no reason you couldn't you know, put in your materials request as an individual and say, this is what I'm providing. And run the risk that in the planning procedure, they'd say, mm, it doesn't look socially responsible to us. We're disapproving it, in which case you'd have to go find three or four other people. Yes? Right. Then say people want to have, well, we want another folk space, and that's what we actually know. We want a park. Okay, so that's just at that level. So immediately get into a kind of political conflict because they're all socially important, but different classes of all different groups of people within that one town. Okay, let, 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 can people hear him? Okay, so yes. There will be neighborhoods where people disagree when they get together. Do we need swing set? I mean, I mean it'll happen. It's, it's not just easy to imagine. We should expect it. Right. There, there, there are people in the neighborhood that are going to say, we need, you know, we, we need to repair the sidewalks. 
And there's going to be people say, no, we need the, you know, we need new swing sets for kids. Well, I don't have kids and I'm, you know, and I'm tripping on the sidewalk and I just got injured. So uh, there's no claim that this is not a vision of harmony. People are people and we're not always harmonious. We, we don't agree. But, and you're absolutely right, that neighborhood, there, there has to be some sort of democratic decision-making process within the neighborhood about which of those things they're going to be asking for at which point in time. Now, it's, it's really, I mean, here there is, we have an example in the real world where this kind of stuff has been going on. It's called participatory budgeting. And we've got 20 years of experience with it in places like Porto Alegre and, and, and Kerala, India. And it became, I mean, this was originally an incredibly radical, impossible idea. You mean, you know, the bureaucracy of city governments aren't going to decide where it is that the public services are provided and what they look like in the different neighborhoods? You're going to actually just say, here's your share of the budget and do what you want with it, have a meeting? I mean, this was incredibly radical and it was so spectacularly popular and successful. I know it had lots of problems in different places, but it was basically such a good idea that even the World Bank came out and said, we're all for participatory budgeting. Um, so, and, and are those meetings not, yes, those meetings are contentious and there is no alternative to, and in the end, it's one person, one vote. Now, I mean, it, the same thing's going to happen in workplaces. You're going to have discussions in workplaces about should we do things this way or that way. So it's very important to suppose, I mean, I always want to know, because I'm always outvoted, I always want to know if I'm outvoted, what I can do. And in workplaces, it's very easy. If you're in a workplace and you're constantly outvoted, well, then you want to find the other people who are outvoted with you and you want to leave the workplace and start up a new worker council doing it the way you think makes sense. And it's always more difficult in terms of neighborhoods, but if your neighbors keep repairing the sidewalks and you have triplets and there's no swings and you don't want to use your precious effort rating to put a swing set in your own backyard or you don't have a backyard because you live in an apartment, and you want, then you want to move to a neighborhood where the, there's some other people with kids and they're putting up swings and they're not catering to the needs of old people. So, yes, and it's very important that people are free to move, you know, between jobs and setting up new... You can move to another place, you can move to another workers' council that is more along the lines of your thinking, or suppose your worker council has an effort rating procedure that you just feel is grossly unfair. Then that's a good reason to go and find one that's going about it differently in a way that's more to your liking. They can actually do whatever they want. If a neighborhood says, we insist on consensus before we come to a conclusion, they can do that. I mean, the only thing the proposal says is, it's one person, one vote. That doesn't say whether on any particular issue it has its majority rule, or on any particular issue it's got to be two thirds, or on any particular issue it's got to be consensus. That is up to any council, neighborhood, could be up to any federation to decide. And my own experience in that regard is always, well, start out with consensus and see how much time it takes and see whether or not you actually ever get to an ending or there's, always, or, or there's somebody that keeps blocking. Start out with consensus and then at some point it's a question of how long do you want to stay at the meeting? So, there, so in... In specific answer, there is no particular, we have not taken a position on. Um, I can point out one that's actually more delicate, which is, wait a minute, you've said there's no central planners that say that was socially irresponsible, therefore it's rejected. Much less a central planning board that says that was a socially irresponsible proposal, it's rejected and we are sending you back the one you will now do, we're revising it for you. Instead, what we've said is, no, all the proposals come in, they get evaluated, it's up on the computer screen, you can see whether or not it looks to be socially, and you vote up or down, well, wait, 
So to be accepted, does a worker council proposal have to be voted up by every single other workers council? That would be consensus. Or is it a simple majority? Or is it 60%? And I have not answered that question either. While well, I'm pointing out things we haven't answered, there's something we haven't answered. Now, the easy answer to that, and, I, and I, the answer I'm very comfortable is, well, clearly the people that are living in that system, if they, if they adopt that system, they'll make that decision, won't they? There's one where Robin Hanel and Michael Albert did not dictate the correct answer. That's it. I should point out, we don't dictate answers. Was there something else? I, didn't, I, I wasn't trying to cut you short. I just, okay, I just wanted to be sure that, that I was able to respond to what you were getting at. Yes? Um, what about money? Um, I, I mean, most basic thing in the economy. I know in the town of Lewis, they have the Lewis town. Right. And it's very local. Do you have some kind of thing to trade around or word of mouth? What we basically have is, a, what we have is we have accounting money. Um, as my hosts know, I have not had any actual money this entire trip. Now, I didn't think I needed any because I thought I had my debit, debit card. But it turns out that my debit card is through a, um, a credit union, a small credit union in Portland, Oregon, where my daughter works, actually. And when they saw my first use of it in London, they assumed it had been stolen by somebody, and uh, I can't get into it. Um, but essentially, I mean, the easiest way to think of it is that every individual and all the enterprises basically have a running account. And that's also how you borrow and save. Um, but we wouldn't need currency. Um, you've ordered stuff, and when you go to pick it up, I mean, they swipe it, and it basically says, okay, you've picked it up, and you know, you've now bought that, you walked out with it. Um, so essentially, people, individuals will have sort of a running account of whether or not they have savings, or whether or not they have, you know, or whether or not they have been loaned and have consumed ahead of their effort ratings. Now that, that's an important decision that has to be made. Anybody that wants to save, that's easy for the rest of the, We don't need to ever say no to somebody that doesn't want to use all their income. Um, on the other hand, sometimes there is a reason to say no to somebody that says, this is the 33rd year in a row that I have consumed beyond my income, and of course I am committing that I will pay back. Um, somebody has to be the bad guy and say no to that. Um, now, usually in our system, it's banks. Um, you, you know, you've run out your credit limit and you don't get any more. And our proposal is that that's, since the neighborhood consumption councils are also dealing with special need requests, we're suggesting that seems to be the most sensible place to take care of that, then why not also have them in, basically you want to have them be the ones that are saying when they're, when they're taking in these consumption requests, when they're approved, they're also, in a sense, the ones that are in the position to approve, are you still credible when you are saying, it's just now that I'm consuming beyond my income. I will be making up for that in the future. Um, somebody needs to make those judgments. And our, our proposal has been that the, the neighborhood consumption councils are a nice place to take care of most of that, since they're already taking care of special need requests. So in a sense, we have banks. They are neighborhood consumption council banks, or sort of a committee within the neighborhood consumption council that would be doing that. Um, and in a sense, we have money. Um, I don't think it, it wouldn't feel like the kind of money and credit that, that people are used to. Everyone 
rightfully deserves, whether they work or not, a certain amount of resources so they can basically survive. Would that ever come into it, or would you say no because you've done that for 30 years, you've not contributed? That's, that's a really good question, and, <clears throat> and, and the answer is just very specific. Um, in one sense, you could have a participatory economy that was really hard ass. You don't go to work, and you're not a student, you're not young, you're not retired, you don't go to work, you got no effort rating, you get no consumption right, you starve. I mean, you could have a system like this that was incredibly hard ass. Now, I think that's totally ridiculous. I can't imagine any people who would set a system up like this who would ever opt to run it that way, unless they were Germans. Um, and the people who were starving were Greek. Um, boy, this is on film, isn't it? <laughs> My last name is Hanel. That's a German name. Okay. Um, but of course, the, the, so any society has to decide if we've, just like you have to decide, well, what are, the, what are the conditions for qualifying for disability? Or do you get to retire at 65, 55, or 75? That decision has to be made in any economy. Um, and it would have to be made in a participatory economy. And any economy also has to decide. Suppose there are people who we think should be working, and they decide not to. What do we do? And if we are going to have some level of minimal income, no matter what support are we, and if so, how high? And I think people in an economy such as this would have to go through the process of making that decision. And just like retirement age and disability conditions, it, it, I can't think of any better way than deciding it by a democratic political process at the national level. Um, at least what that minimum is. And then if some region of the country wanted to have it higher than that, I, there's no reason that they couldn't do that. I mean, that, that, the whole model seems quite like hung on uh, work as sort of, I know at the moment it's the reigning sort of ideology that everyone works, everyone must work, but as we come further and further into sort of technological innovations where we no longer actually need to work in certain industries at all, we will one day come to the point where you actually don't need to work to survive at all. You could just set the machines that essentially all you have to do is maintain the machines. Well, at that, point, at that point, then it's not a problem. But as long as, here, here's the issue. As long as there is work that has to be done, then on average people don't find as desirable or more desirable than just leisure. If you have somebody who society thinks should be sharing in that burden and they simply personally say, I refuse, I mean, you could shoot them too. I mean, I, I guess, I mean, you could have a harder ass version <laughs> or you could send them to a gulag. But of course, that's, you know, those are ridiculous. Um, This isn't, if you think about this economy, this is not an economy where there, there's not going to be humongous differences in income. So the whole idea that the way I demonstrate to somebody how valuable I am is by the accumulative possessions. So the, I, I think this is an economy that is, does not have sort of a consumerist dynamic that's built into it. And therefore, hopefully, as we become more and more productive, we will sensibly choose to take more and more of our productivity increases in the form of leisure with, low, you know, with fewer and fewer hours in the work week. And as I said before, the proposal allows for some people to say, well, the standard work week is now 25 hours, but I opt for 15, or I opt for 30. Um, I didn't answer your unemployment issue. It, it was sort of tied with if you didn't have a job at all. One of the advantages of a compre... I mean, <clears throat> there's one of the differences between a market system and any kind of comprehensive planning, whether authoritarian, command, democratic, a la Pat Devine, Hanel Albert, Leibman. So any kind of comprehensive planning system, the plan has a job for everybody that wants a job in it. Whereas in a market system, you can never be sure that 
there will actually end up being jobs for everybody that you know, is capable of working and, and, and wishes to work. So in that sense, um, sort of this, I'm in, I'm in a, we're, we're into the kind of economy that has a very, very different relationship to the whole, of, we're used to economies that have serious unemployment problems because we're used to market economies. And when you leave the world of market economies, one of the huge advantages is that you do not have to constantly tolerate or come up with some sort of special procedures to handle the unemployment problems when they start to arise. You basically take care of that through the planning process. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I think you're next to uh, waiting. Oh, awesome. Um, I think it's worth punishment. What might be done about worker councils that don't fulfill their uh, proposals and also on the other side, uh, <coughs> the consumer councils who don't find their proposals fulfilled? So some, <coughs> you're asking, so we're again talking about the person that says, I'm 35 and I won't work. No, no, I mean, uh, you have a work council that has put forward a proposal to oh. receive their uh, resources and they don't end up fulfilling that. Oh, oh, absolutely. Good question. So, and, and, and notice this is somehow, this is basically where the, remember I told you that, that at some point we're going to go back to ownership? So here we have a council. And last year, they wouldn't be there if they hadn't been approved last year and gotten inputs and gone ahead and produced outputs. And this year, they submit a proposal, and it's not approved. And they revise it, and it's still not approved. And they revise it, it's still not approved. I mean, like, it's approved, and then not fulfilled. Oh. OK. <laughs> yeah, we didn't talk about this. Um, the. In the planning process, you're judged according to what you propose. And that's the only basis upon which we could approve or not approve. Not right. That's right. So what's happened, so what's happened now is you're, you're saying there was a proposal that came in, and it was fine, and it was approved. But then during the year, that's not what they did. So they fell 10% short. Now, in the following year, um, and I didn't talk about this. When councils are awarding, when, when workers' councils are awarding themselves their effort ratings, think about this. Why wouldn't a workers' council just award themselves all astronomically high effort ratings? Um, so some people are, I frequently get asked, is there inflation? Isn't there going to be inflation in your economy? And if you think about it, of course there's not inflation. There's, there's the only prices are these prices that we're using during the planning procedure. This inflation is not a problem. But you could have effort rating inflation, where there's this perverse incentive for our workers' councils. There's 10 of us, the 10 artists over there. And they say, not only did we get our proposal approved, but we now give ourselves 150% above average effort ratings. Um, you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. So there needs to be some sort of thing that prevents that. And there's two ways of preventing it. One way is you say, look, and for large workplaces, I think this makes a lot of sense. If you've got 1,500 people working someplace, and then you have you know, 1,000 people working someplace else, is it reasonable to assume that in those two groups, the average effort and sacrifice is roughly the same. Probably it is, law of large numbers stuff. Um, I think it's problematic for small councils, because why would you necessarily believe that? So one way, to, one way to solve the effort rating inflation problem is to say the average effort rating for every worker's council has to be the same. So if you give somebody a much higher than average, then somebody else you have to rate low. You can't just rate everybody high. The other way to do it is to look at the social benefit to cost ratio. And this is, this is the, the part that's an answer to your question. So suppose it was approved, but then actually what you did came up 10% short. 
next time around, you could cap the average effort rating for every workplace according to what its previous social benefit to social cost ratio had been. And so, the, so, so in effect, what that would be saying is that you didn't deliver, and in the next round, when you're handing out amongst yourselves, you can still hand out an individual a high one and another, but on average, you now have to adjust down what it is that, that your effort ratings are. Because, in fact, last year, you did not do what you promised the rest of us you were going to do. So there's basically two different rules. You could, you could either cap the, you could make all the effort ratings, the average effort rating for every worker council is the same nationwide, or you could simply have the average effort rating for every worker council is equal to their social benefit to social cost ratio, but the actual one that happened rather than the one that they proposed and promised if there's a difference. What would happen in case of bad weather, for example? I mean, you could have circumstances where it's not due to the... Yes, individual. Individual effort. All kinds of circumstances, you know. If you had the average rule, it wouldn't matter. You'd basically be saying <clears throat> there, there would be no possibility of penalizing for something that wasn't their fault. Um, if you use the other one, you would have the possibility that you're penalizing somebody for something that wasn't their fault. I mean, the same thing would be, I mean, when, when, when you don't deliver what you had committed to, there has to be a reckoning in any case. And again, there's, in a situation like that, it's basic, I think it's unavoidable that you're going to have to have some sort of discretionary process whereby the explanation is the weather was bad rather than the explanation is that we just went and drank at the pub an extra two hours every day. <laughs>